shed time again and working on the Riley uh, just a little bit tonight but I came out and I've made the fuel lines that go from the petrol tank to the fuel selector switch over there and then a hard line that runs down and there's a joiner because the forward section of the fuel line is attached to the chassis this section is attached to the body I was considering putting in a, an anti-vibration loop in this but I think because this is a long straight piece and there's not much movement between well hopefully not much between the frame uh, the body and the chassis down there that's all pretty pretty rigid because there's a big solid piece of timber there um, that should be fine if, if it flexes there's enough movement in the pipe to handle that uh, it's come out fairly neatly I think that's that's not too bad and the fuel selector switch now I've got that in place I know which pickup is the main and which one's the reserve so I've marked those I did put anti-vibration loops here uh, just because there might be some flex in the fuel tank uh, because it's sitting on rubber so there could be a little bit of movement there but uh, that's for the main that's the reserve and either that position or that position is off so that's done um, I do still need to solder the pickup tube to the little fittings here uh, I've gone with olive type fittings so you can take these on and off um, so I'll need to remove these and I will solder the pickup tubes the main one goes a certain distance down the reserve goes as close to the bottom as you can get the main is shorter because you want the main to run out first and then you switch over to the reserve so I need to take the tank out again so I can paint the outside of it and then I can fill it up with the known quantity of petrol to figure out how long that main pickup needs to be but I think that should work okay uh, it all came out fairly neat there's enough movement in there it clears the seat down here it's fairly out of the way in the tail it's not going to get knocked about uh, I've also found out about the lights uh, basically I do have to follow the rules for the lights so the indicators I have to follow the rules for those and that's if I fit them which I will um, but the the lamps I use don't need to have standards markings on them Normally, if you're building a hot rod or a modern sort of scratch-built car, like a race car or a special sort of car, um, all the lamps and things have to have standards markings on them to show them that they're up to spec. But for a vintage car, you, they can ignore that rule. You can use original lamps. Um, you can even use original lamps with modern bits in them, apparently. So these should be fine because they're just fairly simple bulb holders. Um, I've been looking at some suitable lights which I'll probably get from uh, the vintage automobilist in the UK not cheap it's probably gonna be about 500 New Zealand dollars probably $600 by the time I get them here for lamps but they've got period lamps reproductions with dual bulb holders um, with like an amber bulb and a clear bulb so they will mount on top of the guards here uh, I don't fancy my chances of being able to find two good original vintage ones and enough other ones to be able to modify just parts like that are getting so hard to find down so I think it's worth just buying the the reproductions the other thing I do need is a high stop lamp and that's not a low volume rule that's actually a standard New Zealand uh, warrant of fitness rule any car that's first registered in New Zealand after I think it's 1990 has to have a high stop lamp and it has to be rectangular in shape and there's a minimum size I think it's three square inches um, I actually had that problem on my MGB because the registration on this had lapsed and I re-registered it and it was after 1990 they made me fit a high stop to it so I ended up repurposing a number plate lamp um, and we just basically painted the glass red so I might be able to do something like that again 
uh, on the on the Riley. But another idea I had, um, I may do that still, use one of those lamps. But the other thing I realized is I might be able to mount it to the uh, the boot lid. So the body of the car is going to be steel because that's what they originally were. And I've got much better chances of doing decent welds on steel than aluminium. Uh, even though I did do the aluminium on the Austin, I think it'll just be better on the on the Riley. Uh, the aluminium bodies, the, the doored ones, because, because you've got the doors in there, there's no rigidity in the body really, so they flex and the aluminium will crack. So I'm going to use steel for the body. It's also easier to paint. But I'm going to use aluminium, I think, on the door skins. Uh, the bonnet is aluminium, of course, and the boot lid can be aluminium because those are single pieces. There's no welding. So I might as well make those lighter. Um, I actually already did have an attempt at a door skin from aluminium based on my pattern, but I think I got too much shape in that one. I think that's a little over curved, but um, there's not a huge amount of shape in that. So it should be fairly easy to make, make another one of those or another two of those, of course. Uh, that'll make the doors a little bit lighter as well and uh, I've forgotten what I, where I was going with that but if I make the 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 boot lid even though there isn't really a boot out of aluminium I could build in an integrated aluminium housing so like a little a little fared in thing with the with the high stop in there so you won't really see it um, and I, I might be able to make it quite low profile, I think, because you look at modern cars, some of them, you know, it's just a strip of LEDs. So I may be able to make something that's actually quite unobtrusive. Um, and, you know, it can mount here. This is pretty much the highest point of the car. And that should meet that requirement. Uh, tail lamps, there'll be brackets that go on there. And I think I should be able to, be able to arrange it. I need to check the rules for this. Uh, the front lamps obviously have the amber indicators. I do have tail lights. Uh, where did I put those? I can't actually remember where they are because I cleaned up. So now I don't know where anything is. Uh, they're probably up there somewhere, but I have got a set of modern reproduction tail lights, little round ones. Um, I'll have to check and see if they've got matching amber ones because then you could just mount, you know, a pair, red ones and amber ones. If not, I think I should be allowed to make the the rear red lamps flash uh, to act as indicators. I'm pretty sure that would be allowed. Uh, in which case, I think what I need to do is you would have relays on the uh, on the ground for those lamps. Uh, so you you normally have power going to them for the tail lamp and the stop lamps. And I think if you interrupted the ground, you could make them flash. Uh, maybe something like that. I've also been looking at switches. And um, from the same place, I can get a nice uh, a sort of a toggle switch or not a, uh, like a paddle switch. It's a long paddle with a indicator bulb in it, um, a green indicator. So that meets that requirement of having to have that indication that the the blinkers are on um, they also have a, a similar switch which is clockwork which looked pretty interesting so it's it's got a little paddle and you turn it and it winds up a clockwork mechanism and as the clockwork unwinds it causes the lamps to flash and eventually it turns itself off they're self-cancelling um, i don't know though if those are um, if you can cancel them by hand so because otherwise, obviously, you'd turn the corner and your indicators are still going for, I think they flash for about 20 seconds, 17 seconds, something like that. Uh, and it's a bit unclear if you can manually cancel them. But otherwise, one of those might be quite nice. I don't know what the quality of them is like. Um, I think originally things like that might have been used in early MGs. So they, they look a bit like they could go wrong. So I think I'll stick with the... The, the solid paddle mechanical switch. Um, interestingly, on the page where they sell all the switches, they also sell 
this sort of switch. I'm, I'm guessing it's probably not branded Heller, but it looks like exactly the same switch. So there's always still that. I, you know, I could use a, a toggle. Um, but I think the paddle is a bit more in period. Um, so I think that was where we were at. Um, headlamps, again, you use um, relays and just a simple switch to switch between high beam and um, normal, the dipped beam. Petrol tank. The other thing I need to do before I can start painting the chassis, and this is why I've got these guards out, these are old ones that have been modified from original Riley guards, is make the brackets that clamp the guards in place. And I have some pictures of originals, so I think I've got a pretty good idea of how to do it. There's a, I think it's normally cast, there's a sort of boss that bolts on here, two bolts, and the, the guard stay drops through it, through a hole, and there's a, a nut on the bottom, and that's what locks it into place. So I need to make one of those there. Then for the rear one, it's kind of going to depend on what style guards I want. So if I go with the more cycle style guards, it needs to go here somewhere. And that one is a, a flat plate with two bolts through it and a sort of peg that comes out. And the rear guard stay has a tube that sits over the peg. And the peg has a little notch in it, I believe. And there's a, a bolt on the tube that you do up. So it locks into that little notch and that, that holds the rear, the rear guard stay in place. Um, I believe the guards were, were removable on all of the cars because people used to race them. So depends, like I say, what style guard I want. Um, I quite like the, the longer, um, the sort of long straight ones. So they come up here and they just come straight down, a bit like the, uh, what I've got on the Austin, in which case I'd need a, a stay down here instead. So I have to have a think about that. Um, you know, what, what sort of guards are better? And then, uh, apparently these are notorious for, for rattling around. So you'll see a lot of cars with a diagonal brace. They'll use um, like a, a pieces of steel rod under tension that go across here. But it gets a bit tricky, of course, because you have to clear the headlamps. So... I'm not sure the guards will be up kind of like that. Um, so I'll have to see exactly where I can mount those stays. And it kind of depends on how far back the lamps are. Um, because I think those those rods normally normally attach to this somehow. So if I do that. I may need to move my lamps back. Uh, the lamps are in about the right position when they're on mine. It looks like they're right when they're sort of in line with the shock absorbers there, the dampers. So this one you can see is, which means I would have to shorten my little arms here, but that's pretty easy. You know, I can, I can easily drill more holes in these, make these shorter. Um, I believe they should be shorter anyway. And yeah, that would give me, this is a piece of fuel line. Um, actually, if they're, if they're on the front there, I might be able to get away with it. If you make, if I made some sort of clamps to hold these that come up to the guards, they sort of cross over like that for extra support. Um, I've seen other cars, I think one of them up here has just a thing bolted, a bar bolted right across the front. So, um, and these are those longer style guards. You can see how they they swoop back nicely. Because um, that would be that would be the other way to do it is just a, a bar straight across. But I, I like the diagonal cross ones. I think. So I guess take out the petrol tank, paint it. And then I can I can bolt it back in place to do a test fill, and actually I could do a complete test start off the engine running off the fuel tank. Then I just need to put the battery back in, uh, and I can check that the fuel pump works. 
Um, I did briefly consider having a, a, a rubber hose down here so I could put a fuel filter in there, but I think with SUs like this, um, I believe the accepted wisdom is you don't have a fuel filter before the pump because if it ever blocks up, you'll, you'll burn the pump out. And I do have a fuel filter after the pump. And I think these pumps are fairly resistant to, to crap going through them. Uh, there is a sort of strainer on the input line, I believe, uh, in here. I think it's in there. There's a little mesh thing. Um, but being, being as this is a new tank, there's not going to be bits in it anyway, hopefully. So, yeah, that's where we're at. I do like how those have come out. They're nice and neat and out of the way. Um, and vintage looking, I guess. Uh, the good thing about this being such a little car is a sensible place for the indicator switch is actually here in front of the passenger because you can easily you can more easily reach it there than if it's say down here or in here um, the high beam switch can go up here because then it's nice and out of the way and it sort of follows that line i tried to create keep a line there's like a curve through here that the gauges are mounted on um, so yeah the indicator paddle toggle thing can basically go here I think that'll work quite well. There's, I just have to make sure it clears the clock winder. I suppose it could go here as well. I'll have to I'll have to get one and see how big it is. Um, if the if the paddle won't fit there, I, then I can use the toggle. Uh, yeah. I wonder if I need a, a beer holder. And and that's the so that's fuel pump magneto off uh, and then over here the charge side and tail lamps and all lamps uh, I did wonder if it was possible to to make one of these positions um, dip beam and then the other one is high beam, but I think it'll just be easier to have another switch. So, there we go. Oh, that's the choke. Uh, the other thing I think I will do, I think I've mentioned this before, is I will turn the steering wheel around. So I'll rotate this 45 degrees, so that straight ahead is more like that. Uh, so you can see the oil gauge. But it's getting close to being done, the, the chassis part anyway. I'm out in Little Shed for once. Um, we're going to be restaining our decks. So I've been out with the water blaster, cleaning those, getting the doing the prep work, and I really hate washing cars. It's just not something I enjoy at all. So I had a look online and did a little bit of um, investigating into these uh, snow foam cannons. And I ended up buying a Chemical Guys one. It seems to be well rated. Uh, it's very well built. It's all, it's all brass. Uh, it's quite heavy and I got some of their snow foam stuff and uh, since I had the water blaster out to do the decks I thought I'll give it a try on the cars and it actually works really well um, it depends what sort of product you use in it I used that their cleaning solution which is what honeydew uh, it's got quite a nice smell it's an interesting smell it smells like melons or something um, so I gave it a, an initial clean with that and um, I did also buy one of their washing mitts which is just a, a microfiber, microfiber glove but like I say I'm too lazy to really do that um, 
and I'm also too lazy to really dry the cars off, which you're supposed to do. You're supposed to work a meter at a time and clean it all off with, with water and then dry it all off carefully. Um, what I ended up doing is I did the first wash with that honeydew stuff with the foam. Uh, makes really thick, good foam. Sprayed that all over the cars. Um, I then used the water blaster without the foam cannon to wash all of that off. And then I used, I think it's just armor all, um, like a wash and wax, which you can also put through the, the um, foam cannon. So I did that. So I just sprayed on another layer of that foam and let it sit for a bit and again just washed it off. I didn't bother drying anything uh, and it's actually come up reasonably well. Uh, the bonnet always looks crappy because I repainted that. But um, Head Gardener's car, which gets zero love and was filthy, looks a bit cleaner, which is good. I'm impressed actually at how well it worked. Um, I didn't think it would be that good. I think it depends a lot on what the cleaning products you're using are in it. And this, this one is a pH neutral one. Um, apparently you can get, I think it's alkaline, which will help break through grime and stuff a little bit better. So you can use those as well. The neutral ones I think are meant to be safer for the paint. Not that I really care about the paint on the, the Landy or the... Um, the other car there so no it's good if you're lazy um, I really need to go and have another go with my polishing thing on the side of the landy the paints all scratched up and the last time I tried had a go with that I've actually left more <laughs> more swirls in the paint than I took out I don't think you can see it on the camera very easily um, again I'm, I'm not too bothered but it's worth playing with it just to see so the reason I came out here was to, to take this stuff back over to Big Shed. That was just the washing wax I used. Um, nothing fancy. I got it because it was on special probably. Uh, like I say, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this how you're supposed to do it. Um, really you know people people get quite into detailing their cars and you start looking it up online and there's all sorts of arguments and opinions and things about how to do it and what's best and what works and what doesn't and how you should do it uh, i just want to spray some water over it and get the dirt off so that's that's pretty much all i do i'm up behind big shed near the new little shed and the water tank uh, with a giant erection. Basically, oops, I've made this thing, which is a very simple, very crude wooden stand. Uh, I've run a string line down from the diverter, which I've added to the downpipe here, and using that string line, I've got the height of these legs. And this is just to hold the, the pipe that's going to take the water to the tank. So the idea is this just gets shoved behind the shed. I don't need to dig it into the ground. Um, it's just going to lean between the walls. It's only there to hold that pipe up at the right angle. So I'm going to shove that through in behind the sheds. And then I'll be able to trim the ends uh, to get it to fit. This... Uh, Oh, like any good erection, it involved blood, and I managed to cut myself. But this... This is the little diverter, so the water comes down the pipe, and some of it, uh, it'll get collected in here, flow to the tank, and then when the tank backs up, it goes down the, the pipe. Uh, interestingly, when I cut this pipe, there was water up to this level. And because this downpipe fills that water tank, uh, there wasn't that much water, but I'm guessing the level here, because that tank is full, must be, the water must be right up to the top of that tank. So obviously water finds the level, so if that thing's full, this pipe's going to be full up to a certain point as well. Uh, which is good, it means we've got plenty of water, which 
going by the indicator looks like we have I need to get up there actually and uh, it's meant to be stainless steel but of course it still rusts I might spray it with something just to make sure it still actually goes up and down I wouldn't want it to get stuck and then we run out of water and we don't know so this is the the diverter um, this pipe will just sort of push over that pipe and I'll just put a hose clamp around it but uh, let's get this shoved behind the shed have the frame in place between the sheds just use some supposedly UV proof cable ties and a bit of a flex hose to um, drain the water into the tank this is it's a fairly loose fit so there's room for air to get out as the water goes in hopefully there's enough room for the air to get out otherwise it'll just pop the hose out um, and on this side again there's the frame it's just kind of jammed in between there it was actually a bit tricky getting it in I had to use another stick to bend the middle in to get it past the back of the thing I'm, I'm sure I've scratched the back of this to heck but that's okay nobody will see it and then I need to get some uh, little saddle clamps and I will rivet this to the side of the shed and uh, I think I'll also need a clamp for this because now I've cut it it's a bit it's a bit floppy so um, I'll look for a couple of clamps for that I don't think I've got any but they're easy enough to get and I need to push this a bit bit further onto here um, of course this black pipe comes on a big roll so it takes a while for the curl to come out of it but I think once it's sitting in the Sun for a bit it'll it'll straighten out and hold its shape quite nicely so this is probably only gonna need three or four clips along here and I'll just drill through and pop rivet them in and just seal the edges uh, I think that should work fairly well and we may get some rain to test it out uh, the weather's supposed to be good that's why we're looking at staining the decks tomorrow that's why I was washing them today but uh, so hopefully it, it would be nice if it rained a little bit overnight so I can test this but not so much we can't stain the decks tomorrow because I've been doing pressure washing water blasting um, and fiddling around with the new shed and the water tank I haven't actually done anything on the car today but I've been having to think about it and something I said in the last film uh, made me think about the aluminium and doing the body in aluminium and if it would crack or not and I think I even mentioned that the racing bodies without doors often tend to crack because of the flexing of the body and uh, my car has doors so I probably wouldn't have that problem because the body is split already at the point where it flexes um, which is which is around here the middle if you look at a something like a type 35 Bugatti I'm not sure if all of them are like that uh, like this or if it's just some of them but you'll notice the body is in two halves and there's usually a I think they have kind of a joining strip with leather or something in the middle so the body is actually split even though it's a single body so looking at mine and given that I've built the frame way over size it, it didn't need to be this thick the original ones weren't quite this thick I just didn't fancy my chances as a woodworker so I, I sort of made it a bit heavier but I should be able to panel this in aluminium and not have it flex or crack anywhere um, I guess the only place it might be likely to do it is up around here not really sure like I say I did the the Austin 7 is an aluminium bodied car so I've done it before I've got really no excuse not to be able to do it again um, I know how to shape the panels this one was all gas welded but I do have TIG now so I don't really have an excuse not to do it in aluminium and uh, you can't quite see where the welds are on this if you look on the inside you can see the welds 
there's a whale belong here basically um, so I, I could basically do it the same way and if you break it down carefully you realize there isn't a ton of shape in it there's a lot of curvature and stuff like that but you you kind of make it in sections so um, you would make a panel that goes over the top here and there's a join along the side here and then a panel that goes down here uh, the tail gets a bit interesting so you could either have this side panel come all the way around and have a join here I think that's probably how I'd do it um, over the front the scuttle that's again pretty easy there's a piece that goes over the top you'd have a join along here somewhere the other thing is I can put my joins where the frame is um, to give a bit more support so there's no reason I can't do this in aluminium um, and I've got aluminium here so I might as well at least give it a shot uh, the, the main advantage of doing it in aluminium, well there are two main advantages, is the weight of course. So if I'm using 1.6mm aluminium, which is pretty thick, but it gives me a lot to weld and file, um, compared to say 1mm aluminium, 1mm uh, steel, which would be the sort of gauge steel I'd use for the body, it's less than half the weight. And I think a full sheet of aluminium which is 1200 millimeters by 2400 millimeters, which is, I think it's 2.8 square meters, is 13 kg. So not, not that heavy. And using Fusion 360 and the CAD model that I've got off the body, which is what I used to come up with the frame, um, I basically drew the skin, designed the skin, and then built the frame that would fit inside it. And that's how I came up with the templates to build the timber. And I was able to use Fusion to do a, a fairly rough surface area calculation. And not counting the doors and the boot lid, there's, uh, what was it? About 2.54 square meters of aluminium in the body. So that's less than a sheet of aluminium. And that kind of makes sense. Um, I think for the Austin, we said it was three sheets of aluminium to make the body, but that's because you have to cut odd shapes out of it. So you need, you need more to be able to cut the pieces you need. So again, that kind of matches this car. It's a little bit bigger, but that should match. Uh, the body on the Austin 7, I did have it written down up here how much it weighed. And I think you can, yeah, you can still see. So the skin on the Austin 7, which is aluminium, was 13 kg. So basically the same weight as uh, a single sheet of this stuff. Uh, the second advantage of aluminium, of course, is I don't need to paint the inside of it. Um, I'll only need to paint the outside, which is a heck of a lot easier because if I made it out of steel, I'd have to paint the inside before I put it on the frame. And that's been worrying me a bit. If I make it from aluminium, I can attach it to the frame. And because I don't have to paint the inside of it, you just then mask off the inside parts and I just have to paint the outside. So, so I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and do it, do it in aluminium. Um, it's been ages since I've gas welded aluminium. Like I said, I did it on the Austin 7. I'm not sure how good some of those welds are. The penetration's not very good. I do have a TIG machine now that will do AC welding. So it will do aluminium. I think I just need to practice. Um, and if I can get some decent, good, solid welds, 1.6 is reasonably thick material, so there's plenty there to hammer and file, uh, I should be able to get away with it. So that's uh, kind of where I'm at with this at the moment. But uh, yeah, two and a half square meters seems about right. If you sort of rough it out by eye, you probably round that up to three add a little bit more for the doors and the boot lid uh, the bonnet's separate but that seems kind of in the ballpark this is the little cad model i made 
the frame and uh, to get the surface area of the different the different pieces you you basically select it and then hit I to measure and it will give you the measurement over here um, you can change the preferences so it, it, you can change the units that it gives you the measurements in but I think that preference is only for new models so I've changed it but because this is an old model it's remembered the old setting which was in millimeters squared uh, it uses um, the E notation so you have to sort of convert that to to meters squared which is what I did I had to to add them up there's no way you can uh, you can look at two panels at once and it gives you the two selections in the area of both but there's no way to multiply select them and get the total area unfortunately so what I did is I, I sort of went through and um, individually figured them out wrote them down into a, a little file and then added them up afterwards but um, it's very handy it does give you a good kind of approximation uh, this here is the the door skin I may have left off a few little sections sort of like here and there's another little a little face here all these little faces do add up so maybe three square meters off material in the body sounds about right Not so much Riley content this weekend, uh, mainly because I've been doing other things. We are restaining all the decks around our house. So I spent a lot of yesterday water blasting, and today we were actually doing the staining. Uh, so we've done one of them now. There's there's one bigger one to do, and then a, just a small one around the back of the house. So I haven't been working on the Riley. Uh, I've just been having a beer and catching up on some YouTube films and just watching Randall's latest one um, and he was talking about rubber band powered balsa aeroplanes and I remembered I've also got one that's sort of half built so it's a little uh, P51 Mustang which when I first moved to Wellington which turns out to be sort of nine years ago now. Um, obviously, I, I didn't move permanently. I came down to see what it was going to be like. So I still had my house in Auckland and my shed and all my car stuff was in Auckland. So while I lived in Wellington, I lived up on the terrace in Wellington in a little tiny, it was just a like a two-bedroom flat. Um, quite nice, nice little location right at the top of the terrace. Uh, handy in the middle of town although to get to it you had to go up a big massive flight of stairs which got a little bit tiring from time to time but because I'm sort of a mechanically minded person I needed little projects to do so I took all my plastic modeling stuff down and um, I say plastic modeling stuff as if I'm a plastic modeler I think I've made about four models since I, I got back into it and that must have been 10 years ago, um, so I don't do it very often. But I took all that stuff with me, and I also got this little balsa wood plane. Um, and was building that, and then ended up buying a house, and moving all my stuff down, and getting back into car projects. So this has been sitting in this state for 8 years nine years uh, and it looks like I've got quite a long way so I've got the fuselage built and the wings built I just need to finish the rest of it um, so yeah I thought that was interesting that some of us old car people seem to have very similar hobbies um, yeah just an interesting little observation <laughs> 